Socrates once stated that we should follow the argument wherever it leads. When we look at the most profound question of life, does God exist? We should certainly follow his advice. When we do, we'll find evidences that show us God is real. The only way that looking at the evidence shows you that God is real is if you don't do the math. And so, let's do this. Greetings fellow space travelers, Bionic Dance here. Hey look, it's this guy again. A lot of you told me that you couldn't finish my last video because you could not listen to him speak and I can understand that. But this video is very, very important and I assure you he's not going to be in a lot of it. So please, watch to the end. Trust me. By the way, did you know that his name is Kyle Butt? If you don't think I'm childishly giggling at that, you have to ask yourself how well you know me. Let's look at six proofs that show God exists. No, let's not. Let's look at one. Now, if there are any theists out there watching this, I'm sure they're already furiously typing in the comments section that I'm not playing fair or being a wimp. But I've been making videos on the topic of God's existence for 11 years, and I've covered the other five over and over in my more than 1,400 videos. The rebuttals you're seeking are there. I only found one of these reasons even remotely interesting instead of tedious, and that's what this video is about. Number one, the universe must have a cause. The most fundamental law of science is the law of cause and effect. And it says that for every material effect we see, there is a cause that came before it or was simultaneous to it, and that is greater than it. I'm sorry, pal, but citation needed. Because I cannot find the law of cause and effect described in this way. In fact, about the only place I can find anything called the law of cause and effect are on feel-good websites about karma and personal success. In physics, there's something called causality, which is similar, but it says nothing about the necessary force being greater than its effect. And there's Newton's third law of motion, which states that for every action, there is an equal and opposite reaction. And before this video is over, we're going to be touching on quantum physics a little bit, where causality can get really funky. In fact, Mr. Butt himself said in an article that every material effect must have an adequate cause, not greater adequate. So I would very much like to know where he's getting this. The universe is a material effect. So what caused the universe? You see, if you don't believe in a creator, then you have to suggest something like uh, a singularity. That's what is popular today, that there was some type of singularity that exploded in something called the Big Bang. But then when you try to get down to the bottom of what's a singularity, well, what we hear from the scientific community that suggest to us, the, the cosmologists, they say, well, a singularity was something that popped into existence from, from literally nothing. In fact, Lawrence Krauss wrote a book titled A Universe from Nothing, and in that book he said that this singularity that exploded popped into existence from nothing. Yeah, about that. I have a digital copy of A Universe from Nothing, and I did a search. That quote appears nowhere in it. So I did a Google search. That quote did not come up at all. So what's up, right? Sounds like a quote mine taken out of context or not even said at all. Did Lawrence Krauss say it? Nothing is really a boiling, bubbling brew of virtual particles that are popping in and out of existence in a time scale so short you can't see them. Okay, so he kind of said it, but that quote is still nowhere to be found, so it shouldn't have quotation marks around it. The closest quote in the book is, quote, Particles and antiparticles wink in and out of existence like subatomic fireflies, annihilating each other and then recreating themselves by the reverse process, out of nothingness. The spontaneous genesis of something out of nothing happened in a big way at the beginning of space and time, in the singularity known as the Big Bang, followed by the inflationary period when the universe and everything in it took a fraction of a second to grow through 28 orders of magnitude. And Krauss didn't even say it. That's from the afterword by Richard Dawkins. Butt's bullcrap was actually fortuitous because it led me to this video and ultimately to Krauss's book. Now, 
I'm an artist, not a scientist. It's why I usually deal with people's logical missteps and not science. But nothing has made me more want to be a scientist than this video. It's absolutely fascinating. I've watched it several times in order to make sure I understand it, and I probably still only get the gist. The first time around is such an information dump, and watching it again with more context really helps. So what does it really mean? How can something come from nothing? Remember how I said we'd be getting into quantum physics? Yeah, well, buckle up. Nothing. By nothing, I don't mean nothing, I mean nothing. If you take empty space, and that means get rid of all the particles, all the radiation, absolutely everything, so there's nothing there. If that nothing weighs something, then it contributes a term like this. Now, that sounds ridiculous. Why should nothing weigh something? Nothing is nothing. And the answer is nothing isn't nothing anymore in physics. Because of the laws of quantum mechanics and special relativity, on extremely small scales, Nothing is really a boiling, bubbling brew of virtual particles that are popping in and out of existence in a time scale so short you can't see them. The point is, it, we can't measure virtual particles directly, but we can measure their effects indirectly. And in fact, they're responsible for the best predictions in physics. Here, by the way, is actually a, 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 an animation that was shown at the Nobel Prize ceremonies about five years ago by a friend of mine who happened to win the Nobel Prize for, for developing the theory that produced this. This is the space inside of a proton, the empty space inside of a proton. Not where the quarks are, but the empty space between the quarks. And this is, not a, this is an animation, but it's an exact animation coming from physical calculations. This is what the space looks like. Now, how do we know that? Well, there are a lot of reasons, but one of the things are, it turns out most of the mass of the proton comes not from the quarks within a proton, but from the empty space between the quarks. These fields popping in and out of existence produce about 90% of the mass of a proton. And since protons and neutrons are the dominant stuff in your body, the empty space is responsible for 90% of your mass. We don't yet know how anything can pop in and out of existence like that. We don't, but we do know that it's happening. Something definitely seems to be coming from nothing. These are, this is the system and the spikes are where the, well, uh, this is where the mass is in this system. The spikes are where the galaxies are. But you notice most of the mass in this whole system of clusters of galaxies is not where the galaxies are. It's between the galaxies. It's where nothing is shining. About 50 times as much mass in this system, and in all systems we can measure, comes from stuff that doesn't shine. What does that mean, that it doesn't shine? It means that it doesn't interact with observable electromagnetic radiation, like light. And physicists with their linguistic perspicacity have called it dark matter. And we now understand that 90% of the mass of galaxies and clusters, including our own Milky Way galaxy, is made of stuff that doesn't shine. By measuring these, the mass of these systems and this dark matter, taking normal matter plus dark matter and weighing it, we now have determined how much stuff there is in the universe. When physicists have an important number, they give it a Greek letter all the time. So we call it omega. Omega is the ratio of the total amount of stuff we know is in the universe divided by the amount of stuff you need to make a flat universe, the boundary between an open and closed universe. If it's less than one, the universe is open. If it's greater than one, the universe is closed. And we have now measured unambiguously that there's only 30% of the amount of material in the universe, including dark matter, to make the universe flat. Okay, some of you are probably wondering what in hell a flat universe is. As I understand it, in a flat universe, parallel lines will never meet, as opposed to a curved universe where they could. So is space-time curved or not? That's the question. It turns out that in a flat universe, the total energy of the universe is precisely zero. Because gravity can have negative energy. So the negative energy of gravity balances out the positive energy of matter. What's so beautiful about a universe with total energy zero? Well, only such a universe can begin from nothing. The laws of physics allow a universe to begin from nothing. You don't need a deity. You have nothing, zero total energy, and quantum fluctuations can produce a universe. Now how cool is that? Like I said, I've watched this video over and over, and that still gives me goosebumps. But it sounds like that's not the kind of universe we live in, doesn't it? 
So, now what? Well, he takes a really, really long time explaining it, but what it comes down to is measuring the universe and finding its shape by observing cosmic radiation and seeing whether it curves, or something like that. Like I said, I'm not a scientist. I get the gist, but don't ask me to quote the details. In fact, it's right now we know to an accuracy of better than 1%. The universe is flat. It has zero total energy, and it could have begun from nothing. And I've written a piece, although of course I got a lot of hate mail, saying that in my mind this answers this crazy question that religious people always keep throwing out, which is, why is there something rather than nothing? The answer is there had to be. If you have nothing in quantum mechanics, you'll always get something. <laughs> it's that simple. It doesn't convince any of those people, but it's true. Now, great, we know the universe is flat, but if you've been awake, you realize, I, 10 minutes ago I proved the universe was open. There's only 30% of the stuff in the universe needed to make it flat. Where's that other 70%? Well, if you put energy in empty space, so empty space weighed something, you wouldn't see it. It's the empty space between the galaxies. You're far away from the galaxies, you wouldn't see it. But what would that empty space do if you put energy in it? Well, it produced a cosmological constant. That would cause the expansion of the universe not to slow down over time, as any sensible universe should do, but to speed up over time. And if just for fun one believed it was speeding up and asked how much energy would you have to put in empty space to make it speed up by the amount we measure it, it's exactly the amount we are missing. Everything holds together. Our new picture of cosmology is that we live in a universe dominated by nothing. The largest energy in the universe, 70% of the energy in the universe, resides in empty space. Everything we see, stars and galaxies and clusters, everything we see, if you get rid of it, the universe is essentially the same. We constitute a 1% bit of pollution in a universe that's 30% dark matter and 70% dark energy. We are completely irrelevant. Why such a universe in which we're so irrelevant would be made for us is beyond me. As I said in the beginning, nothing makes me want to be a scientist more than this. I want to know more, and I want to be part of finding it. But I'd probably have to choose between going back to school for cosmology and animation. I already have a lot invested in that one. Plus, I hate to say it, but I kind of suck at math. It really is the most poetic thing I know about physics. You are all stardust. You couldn't be here if stars hadn't exploded, because the elements, the carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, iron, all the things that matter, for evolution, weren't created at the beginning of time. They're created in the nuclear furnaces of stars, and the only way they can get in, into your body is if the stars were kind enough to explode. So forget Jesus, the stars died so that you could be here today, okay? I love that bit. And when I hear people like Kyle Butt spouting their blinkered pig ignorance, spinning their goofy fairy tales that require faith instead of this kind of study, rendering both faith and God unnecessary, it's enough to make any thinking person's blood boil. Now, it's true, I've edited Lawrence Krauss's talk quite a bit for time, and there's a good chance I've gotten things wrong or condensed them too much. I have the humility to say I don't know what I don't know. So, naturally, the link is in the description. Go check it out. It's about an hour long, including an intro by Richard Dawkins and some audience questions. Until next time, fellow space travelers, this is Bionic Dance saying don't run on automatic. Instead, please think when the universe and everything in it took a fraction of a second to go through, grow through, oi, damn it, uh, we don't yet know how anything can pop in and then out of the, into the, wow, mm. it means that it doesn't interact with observable microwave, no, not microwave, as I said in the beginning, nothing makes me, mapes me, mapes me, You know, Dewey, we wouldn't have to do this if I had more Patreon patrons. Just saying. Droids don't pull people's arms out of their sockets when their videos aren't rated. Bionic dancers are known to do that.